Hi, today we're here at ASM Live for Micro 2017 in New Orleans. I'm Shopa Gedwal, the Career Resources Specialist with ASM, and today we'll be discussing how to find and acquire the right job. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand in the audience and we will take them. If you have any questions on Facebook, leave it in the comments section. Today we have with us Olga Calderon, an assistant professor at LaGuardia Community College, and Cara Levinson, a clinical microbiology CPEP fellow at the University of North Carolina. So to get started, um, since this session is mainly focused on finding a job, can you both um, provide our audience some tips and tricks that you learned along the way while you were applying for your specific jobs? Okay. <laughs> so um, my uh, trajectory was um, a little bit uh, different in the sense that I had been in the institution uh, working for the same institution for many years. So. Uh, close to 30 years actually. But during that time, I had um, a, different positions, uh, mainly working in the laboratory. Um, at some point, I was the chief laboratory technician for the science labs. So throughout my tenure at La Guardia, I was attending school, getting my degree. So once I had uh, I obtained my degree, my PhD, then um, I applied for a job. Even though I was there, I still had to apply for a job. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a pool of 135 people uh, together applying with me, and there were a total of five positions available. So I thought, okay, I have a good chance, and people knew me, um, and so. I, I still had to go through the whole process of um, applying and uh, drafting letters and um, getting letters of recommendation. So um, I applied right after after I graduated from um, my PhD. Mm -hmm. So um, I can talk a little bit more about the details you sure. know, later. Sure. I mean, you can share sort of like um, in terms of getting those reference letters, who did you know how to go to? And you know, how did you know that they would give you a good recommendation letter? Okay, so again, I was, I was actually a student at LaGuardia Community College 30 something years ago. Mm -hmm. And so people knew me, a lot of the faculty, also they have retired, but I went to um, a couple of deans my chairperson at the moment, um, and also my graduate advisors. And so um, those were the people that provided me with the letters and they had no problem. They knew enough about me and about the work that I did. So um, it, it was easy in a way to get those, yes. Um, yeah, uh, so I was really lucky in that I kind of figured out what I wanted to do at a pretty young age. And early in my undergraduate career, I was able to do an internship at a state lab. And it was kind of the first opportunity that I learned you could do research outside of kind of an academic institution. So um, I've always been interested in a lot of different things. My training is primarily in public health, um, but I have a degree in epidemiology. I'm a clinical microbiology fellow. So um, I've kind of dabbled around a bit. and. You know, I'm interested in kind of where they all come together. And especially in public health, you know, there's not a clear track. Most people in the field get there all kinds of different ways. So uh, that's kind of the fun part about it. And you really have to just kind of pick and choose what you're most interested in. And hopefully they'll all come together into a job at some point in the near future for me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so for you, Cara, you're a CPEP fellow, yeah. right? So you're a clinical microbiology fellow. Mm -hmm. What's that application process like? And, and you know, for the people sure. that might be interested in clinical microbiology, can you talk about a little bit in terms of who goes into that fellowship? Yeah, uh, we actually had a breakfast this morning with all the CPEP fellows that are currently in the programs all over the country. And it was really interesting to hear how everyone found it and kind of what we're all doing. Uh, I found it because I knew I didn't want kind of a traditional postdoc. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of academic trajectory is it's not something I'm interested in. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I started looking up kind of alternative postdocs and 
found there really weren't a lot. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of being appreciated more now and there's more of them coming, which is great. Uh, but CPEP really stood out pretty quickly as an alternative career uh, than going kind of the traditional postdoc route. So that's how I found it. Um, if you go to the ASM website and just look up CPEP, you can find uh, information about the program, uh, information about the institutions that host the program, and an application if you'd like to be, be one. Okay. And so in terms of the application process, like was mm -hmm. there, what was the most challenging part for anyone that might be considering, yeah, you know, um, applying? Start early. Uh, some of these programs mm -hmm. you have to apply up to two years in advance. Most are at least 12 months. So 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. I applied, uh, gosh, a little over a year before I actually defended my thesis. So definitely if you find a program you're interested in, reach out to the program director and see if they're taking fellows. It's a two-year program and they don't always take a fellow every year. So um, you just want to make sure you, if you find a program that it aligns with kind of your graduate school. Um, timing, uh, but definitely start early and just start figuring out what your options are because mm -hmm. it takes a while and you're also, you know, finishing your PhD, it takes a while to write a dissertation, so to be able to juggle the both, you really need to start early. Yeah. What about you for Olga, since you're an assistant professor, what's usually the timeline with that in terms of how early should you apply? Yeah, you should start looking into it when you're almost ready to defend, mm -hmm. um, when you're writing your dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say about a year and a half, a year, um, because the process is long. Uh, for example, for the job that I was applying to, mm -hmm. even though I was, again, within the same university, CUNY, City University of New York, um, there is a process where they post the job in the university's website and th there is like a two month uh, window for people to apply, then mm -hmm. it's closed, then there are the interviews and so the, the entire process just of applying or uh, sending your letter and um, or your, yeah, your application and all of your documents until um, your until you're hired, it's it's about a year. It's about a year. Yes. Okay. So it takes a while, and you yeah. go through several interviews. I went through four interviews. Mm -hmm. So, so you you went through four rounds of interviews for yes. your position. Okay. Yes. What about you, Cara? Um, you apply in the CPAP program. There's kind of a general application, and you pick which programs you're interested in, and it gets sent out. And then the programs reach out to you for a secondary application if they're interested in you. Uh, and then once you know they're interested in you, uh, I actually got an email from the lab director just making sure I was on my correct timeline to graduate in time to uh, start the program. Mm -hmm. And then you actually fly out and you interview. So I was I was only there for a day and a half, but I think I interviewed with. Oh uh, gosh, uh, like seven people seven throughout the people course of one day. Okay. So about 45 minute interviews. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. They keep you busy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so in terms of the interview process, um, you know, were you speaking to scientists and non-scientists or was it mainly scientists that you were focusing on? Either one. Okay. <laughs> so uh, both. The first round of, in of interviews mm -hmm. um, is uh, done by a committee of five people. Mm -hmm. uh, four scientists and one non-scientist from another department. So um, they have general questions as well as specific questions mm -hmm. on, um, you know, your aptitude towards the job. Mm -hmm. um, then the second interview is with the chairperson of the department. Mm -hmm. The third one is with the provost, which um, sometimes it's not a science person, mm -hmm. and then with the president of the school. Okay. And how were those discussions different between the non-scientists and scientists? It was more of general questions okay. um, in education. They want to have a sense of whether the mission of the school lines with your mission um, as a teacher okay. and as a researcher. You mean like with the provost or like with yes. anyone that's outside of the non-scientific yes. realm? Okay. It was it was kind of informal because again, they, they know me mm -hmm. uh, or they knew me for a long time, but still it was, um, uh, it was um, the, the questions I imagine that were pretty similar to what uh, they have for other candidates. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you? 
firm? So I think I interviewed primarily with scientists, but there were all varying levels of scientists. Okay. Uh, I, I actually, you know, you go to lunch with the current fellow, and while it's lunch, it's still an interview, uh, mm -hmm. officially or otherwise. Uh, so certainly being able to talk to people, you know, that are your age, at kind of your level, or wanting close to your level. Um, I also met with some administrators, uh, supervisors within the laboratory as well as certainly, you know, the directors of immunology and microbiology in our laboratory. So you get scientific questions, but there are kind of different levels of complexity. So you really do have to be able to, you know, give your project in layman's terms and also be able to answer very kind of highly technical, detailed questions as well, because you'll get all of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's interesting you brought up a point how even the lunches were interviews as well. Yeah, yeah. at least that's how I interpret it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of traits um, do you? What kind of traits were they looking? Or now looking back on it, now that mm -hmm. you got the positions, both of you, like what kind of traits do you think really stood out in your application? Or could they have? I don't know if they might have mentioned to you like what stood out that that made you attracted to that position? Well, um, I found out later, oftentimes yeah. people cried in the interview and I didn't cry. So okay. <laughs> um, I guess that inadvertently made me stand out, uh, but that was <laughs> never my intention. Um, okay. I, I haven't gotten any specific things, but a lot of the questions, especially with more of the supervisors and administrative people, were similar in that they were less interested in your science and more how you fit into kind of the community within the laboratory, how you worked with other people. Mm -hmm. That's really what those questions were more aimed at of, mm -hmm. you know, have you ever had an issue with a coworker? How did you resolve it? Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of questions. So they kind of want to see you as both a person and a scientist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, he has a microphone. Um, can you give us any more details on that? So I think I'm a PhD student right now okay. looking into positions in the industry. Uh -huh. So I know that they want different things from me, like they assess different things. Um, an academic uh, postdoc would require me to know more science, and the industry wants me to wants to figure out whether I'm a more people person or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So could you give us a little more tips on how, I don't know how to answer, right. you know, how to prove I'm a people person. Like, how do you do that in a sentence? Because I'm struggling to, I talk a lot of science uh -huh. and I apparently come off as a nerd and they think that you're a total misfit. So well, I, if you can give more tips sure. on that. Well, I mean, I think you should own the nerdery um, because really we all are in the best way possible, right? We're at a giant conference <laughs> of nerds. Um, but, you know, we're people too. And I think you just have to show that you're passionate about, you know, your science and what you do. And, you know, we're human. We have passions for other things too. Uh, one thing I've found in applications and CVs that I've seen is people will put other things besides just their scientific achievements on there. So, you know, if you're a really accomplished athlete or something like that, you know, they're good talking points also in interviews that they kind of recognize that you're more than just your science experiment, that you really, you know, you're, you're a person too, you have feelings and interests and activities, and it kind of helps you connect with your interviewer on more of a personal level rather than just a nerdy one. Mm -hmm. What about in terms of the interview itself? Like if they, like did you get any questions about, you know, working within a team or, you know, handling a team yeah, or anything like um, that? And definitely. How did that you was, handle that? It, I mean, you're kind of put on the spot, and yeah. I think that's one thing they're looking for too. Mm -hmm. It's not so much your ability to answer the question, but like how quickly you can answer it, what you do when you're put on the spot, because especially in this particular job, you know, you get questions thrown at you all the time. You kind of just have to react on the fly, and it's okay to say you don't know, but you need to know where to get the answer. Um, so I think part of it is just seeing how you react when you're put in kind of unfamiliar situations and making sure that you, know, you don't panic, you don't go silent, that you can actually you know, be calm, cool, and collected. And you know, that's something you only get with practice. I'm not sure I've mastered it yet. Do <laughs> you have anything to add? Okay. Yeah, uh, definitely interpersonal skills are very important and they look for that. And they want to be able to see if you are able to resolve conflict when it arises. So I will suggest for you to perhaps practice with someone mm -hmm. outside your uh, field perhaps, or someone who has a lot of experience, and just practice an interview. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, yeah. yeah, and get some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And welcome. the other thing I'll add on to is that, um, you know, when you're, when you, if they ask a question specifically about 
you know, how you fit well with the team. Give, an, give them an example of the time where you've done something like that in the past. And that kind of then proves that, okay, you know, you're, you, you can do more than just the science. So. Do we have any other questions? Hi. Um, so for the CPEP program, are you trained more to be, I guess, like a manager of a public health lab, or are you trained more on like the techniques that they're using and like more of the lab-oriented stuff, or is it like a combination of both? It's definitely a combination. Uh, it's a lot jammed into two years, which is a good thing. Uh, I mean, the ultimate goal is to get you to be a lab director, whether it's of a hospital clinical microbiology lab or a public health lab. Once you um, do the CPEP uh, program, you can sit for the ABMM or American Board of Medical Microbiology board exam. So you get that certification, you know, you can be a director in any multiple different kinds of laboratories. Uh, as far as the fellowship specifically, at least in our program, and every program is a little bit different, but generally you spend your first year doing rotations through all the different benches and all the laboratories. So it's microbiology, I also rotate in immunology. Um, you also go to the bedside with the ID doctor, so you do some bedside stuff. Um, so you do that in your first year. You also do some outside rotations in your second year. So you go to the state public health laboratory. You can go to DC if you are interested in science policy, that kind of thing. So you do rotations at the bench. So you're learning with the technologists how to identify and sniff the plates. But you're also able to go to meetings and conferences um, at a higher level. So like I go to the weekly supervisor and director meetings. Every year when the hospital goes through its budgets, um, I'm able to attend those meetings. So they train you to be a manager too. That's a little more focused in your second year. So the first year is learning everything. The second year is kind of applying it and helping you put it all together. Okay, any more other questions? All right. Do we have any on Facebook? All right. <laughs> so going back in terms of um, the interview process, once you get an offer, did you guys negotiate your salary or did you negotiate any of the benefits? I did. You did. Because and how was that process? Do you have any take takeaway tips for anyone? Yeah, I think uh, once you are at that later stage, um, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to negotiate. So in my case, since I was there, um, even though I, t I was taking on a different position, mm -hmm. um, I was trying to uh, see if I could get the same salary because I was on the top of the my salary range. Mm -hmm. And so, as an assistant professor, I was going to come at a much lower salary. So I wanted to see if I could keep the same salary, and I was able to. So I was happy about that. However, when I went and interview with the president, in my previous um, job, I had tenure. And I had it for 20 years already. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, can I keep my tenure? Can you transfer my tenure? And she said, no, mm -hmm. um, it's not transferable because this is a different, um, a, 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 a different position, really. You know, mm -hmm. you're now a professor, entering a professorial line. Mm -hmm. and I said, okay. And so, but she said to me, you know what, Olga, do not stress about it. Everybody seems to be, you know, um, getting very nervous about tenure and you know and just enjoy it okay. enjoy what you do yeah. do your thing you know your teaching your research and because i have been um in committees uh, search committees and i had interviewed people i knew a lot about what um the job um entails so so I've been pretty lucky in, mm -hmm. in, in that sense. So I knew what to do, and I never really think much about the tenure. I know it's going to come, and um, it's been, um, I'm going to start my fourth year, but I was just promoted to associate professor, mm -hmm. and that's because of the work that I have done in the last three years, mm -hmm. so. How did you approach that process of negotiating? I just told her, like, once you received the offer, offer you, yes, you reached out to them and, and you asked them if they could. No, it was actually during the interview. It was during the interview yes. when you brought it up. That okay. was my last interview, the fourth one with the, the president, okay. and and That's I really asked right. her. Okay. Right there. So again, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. the, the worst they can say is no. Yeah. 
Uh, and sometimes you you are able to get um, you know in, in a step in salary. So just just negotiate. Mm -hmm. Do you add, do you have anything to add on? Um, I mean, I'm a postdoc, so I haven't had the benefit of being able to negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to uh, when I start looking for a job. But I think one thing that is important is being willing to ask and kind of knowing your worth. So in the process, knowing that I will be applying for jobs in the near future, uh, it's kind of knowing your field, knowing what's uh, an acceptable salary range in your field, and mm -hmm. that differs whether you're going into public health, hospital, or industry, that kind of thing. So just have a kind of understanding of, of what the field is and what other people are getting paid in that field. I think it's um, the most beneficial thing you have going into that interview or negotiation right. process and that. You know, whatever they offer you, you can at least counter it and say, well, this is what someone in a similar position is getting in this area. And I would also mention, you know, certainly you can negotiate salary, but there's other benefits you can negotiate. Oh, yes. Even mm -hmm. if they can't increase your salary, you know, you can get an extra week of vacation time a year or something like that. So yeah. um, there's there's always room to negotiate, I think, yeah. um, and you have to be able to ask for it. Definitely. But I, I will add that... Um, don't ask, don't negotiate or ask for the salary in your first interview. Yeah. <laughs> Just do it at the end when you know yeah. that the, the job has been offered to you. Because the sense of um, what they get from you, if you ask for, uh, for the salary or for too many of the benefits on the first interview, they're like, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. This person is just interested in the salary or no. Um, leave that for the end. Okay, thank you. We have a question on yes, Facebook? we have a couple questions from Facebook. So okay. the first one is from Maria, and she says, I'm a microbiologist, and I have my transcripts from the States. How do I go to the lab after 20 years living all over the world? Oh, gosh. Go to the lab as in, I guess, maybe a clinical lab? Yeah, um, I mean, bring all your paperwork with you. I know I certainly had to have transcripts ready, and I was accepted into the the CPEP program before I'd actually defended, and so it was contingent upon me actually passing my defense. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a letter, but the actual paperwork and acceptance uh, that I got, I needed that paperwork, so I needed my transcript that said I had actually conferred my mm -hmm. degree. Yeah. So it is important to have the paperwork with mm -hmm. you, and you know, I think, yes. especially if you've got lots of experience, global, even throughout the United States, it's really valuable, so yeah. welcome back to the lab. Mm -hmm. We're happy to have you. And I'll also add, like, with, specifically with the CPEP fellow, there are, um, like, when you when you look at the ASM page for the CPEP fellowship, you know, there's a way to um, translate your grades over. So you can take a look at the website to get more yeah. information on that. Any other questions? Yes. So the next question comes from Cassie, and she says, Thoughts on the real viability of a 45-year-old who's just finished her bachelor's on getting a good job in the government sector. Is that impossible? Getting a good job in the government sector? <laughs> I think uh, she's concerned about uh, the age. Mm -hmm. um, so if she has, um, that she has some experience in the, in the field that she wants to go to because um, even if you obtain your degree later in life, if you have experience in that field, uh, which sometimes is, is the case, mm -hmm. then actually is an advantage. Oh, absolutely. And it might be a plus. Yeah, yeah I would say uh, certainly within the CPAP fellowship, you know, the people I'm, I'm working with at the bench side who have been doing this for decades are, they just have a huge wealth of knowledge and it's really great to be able to work beside them because you know, for as long as I've been in school, I'm certainly trained in molecular techniques, but being able to sniff a plate and immediately know what bug is yes. growing on it is something mm -hmm. that you, you can't learn in school that you really cultivate over years of going through plates and understanding kind of clinical scenarios. So I would say if she has, you know, that experience, that it's, it's a really valuable thing and she shouldn't yeah. have trouble finding a job. Mm -hmm. And I mean, experience is definitely important, but, you know, for someone who wants to shift to a different sector, having connections in that in that area will really help. So, you know, Absolutely. if she wants to move to government, you know, making those connections ahead of time is going to be really helpful. We have a question in the audience. A question in the audience. Mm -hmm. Can I add 
out to the last Facebook uh -huh. moment, only because I work in a government lab. Yeah, please. When you go to oh, when you go to usajobs.com, there's a link that says how to fill out a resume and your application for a government position, and it's a whole tutorial and a, I think it's a YouTube also. But follow that exactly because it's not just like a re regular resume where you just submit. I worked mm -hmm. at this place. This is my title. These are my duties. They actually want to know things like your salary, if you were full time, part time. Mm -hmm. They're looking for volunteer experience. Um, I work with animals, and so when I first got my job as the as a microbiologist, animals, I use volunteer experience working at a cat shelter, and they really mm -hmm. like that. So when you're looking for a government job, even if it's not related to that position exactly, if it can be looped into it, go ahead and add it. Okay. Thank you Thank for you. that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I was wondering for each of your positions, how many other applications did you do at the same time you were applying for your the ones that you eventually got into? Yeah. Yeah, for mine were about 135 applications. And uh, there were five positions available. Actually, uh, yeah, the state had, this is City University of New York. Was that the question or my? Um, I was wondering for your, for, yeah, how many did you apply to? Did you oh, how many did I apply for? Yeah, when you were or looking, you when you were actively yeah. looking for Oh, I see, <laughs> sorry. Um, actually, I just applied for this one. And I thought, you know, if I get it, fine. If not, then I'll go somewhere else. Because I still had, at that point, I still have my full-time position, and when I uh, moved to the new position, I took a leave of absence from that position, mm -hmm. and I said, if it doesn't work, you know, if I don't get reappointed on the first year, <laughs> I still could go back to my old position. So I was trying to be a little bit more conservative in my approach, but I was definitely... Um, you know, I, if I didn't get it, I was gonna go somewhere else. Yeah, and sometimes I even look. Even I, I'm happy where I am, but when I get from ASM all of these job postings, I'm like, "Ooh, this should be nice." <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> Good to know. Do you want to add anything, Cara? Sure. Um, I would say, let's see. For, so CPEP, uh, there are 17 programs I learned this morning uh, in the U.S. right now for microbiology. Uh, I believe there's three immunology ones, uh, and uh, you know they don't take fellows every year, so you have to check every year. Um, and I think I applied to five programs, mm -hmm. and I, I interviewed at two, uh, and ultimately I picked one. But uh, I applied to the EIS program with CDC, so again, kind of an alternative pro postdoc. But um, so there really weren't a ton of other options. I obviously had like a backup plan of other kind of more traditional postdoc uh, laboratories I was interested in. So you really do need to plan early and make sure you've got multiple backup plans. Uh, it's the process. Okay. Um, we have a question. So we have a Facebook question from Robbie, and he says, I have a PG diploma in medical microbiology, have 10 years experience in bacteriology, then after 26 years of experience in medical mycology in one of the university hospitals in Saudi Arabia, do I have a chance to get a job in the government sector in the U.S.? So that sounds like a lot of uh, experience to me, so yeah. I, I would say yes, but you know, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not in a position to hire anyone, but you know, that sounds, you know, having years of experience, especially on the bench, and mm -hmm. having those certifications certainly can't hurt. Yeah, and, and we kind of brought this up, but really making those connections is what's going to help you get your job. So for either one of you, did you have any connections prior to getting the job that really kind of helped you get the job? I mean, I know you were already working at your... Yeah, yeah you were already but um, it wasn't, you know, a, um, a security, mm -hmm. the fact that I was there. I had mm -hmm. to go through the four interviews, and they could have said no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. But yeah, definitely, I think the fact that I had a, a very, um, a, a, my, uh, I guess, a reputation already, um, at the job, in the place, in the whole college. People knew me, not just the college, the university. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's your best 
track record. Uh, but uh, if you come in new, yeah, of course, um, having those connections is, is, is important, mm -hmm. not just in the institution, but you know, in other places with people that can give you a good recommendation letter. I think networking has gotten me every job I've ever had. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's hugely important. And I've, I've talked with other kind of CPEP fellows that are in the program currently, and it's all through networking that we either knew a former CPEP fellow or you knew someone else who was applying to the program and looked into it. Uh, it's very much a small world in clinical yes. microbiology. So networking, uh, meeting people who are in the field now, they can certainly provide a lot of direction of, of if you're interested in one of them forward. All right. Well, thank you so much thank um, you. for for being on a, um, for, for being on uh, ASM Live here at Microbe in New Orleans. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, everyone, on Facebook as well. Uh, please stay tuned for more uh, programming here at the Live Theater. Okay, thank you. Thank you. They tell you to put your chin right there. <laughs> and I became an ASM member in 1981. 95? Um, since 2008. I joined ASM in 1974. I've been an ASM member for 41 years. I think I first became a member in 1989. Seems like all my career. And I'm willing to bet it's a decade. My first ASM was 1993. I still have a picture of me holding the program open sitting on the hotel room bed, really excited because for the first time ever, I saw my name in print associated with microbiology. When I was a graduate student at Purdue in 1980, it was the thing. I mean, if you were going to be a microbiologist, you joined the ASM. It was just really that simple. ASM is very special to me because I became a member in 2002, and when I first attended the, the meeting at Salt Lake City, Utah, I met my PhD thesis mentor, Dr. Arturo Casa de Ball. And so ASM kind of introduced me to the PhD world. Definitely the most important thing is that ASM has provided me with a graduate fellowship. So they've helped support me during my graduate training. Um, in addition, I've gotten a lot of networking opportunities and I've met a lot of really great people through ASM. And we can share our work and connect and they can teach me things that I don't know and I can teach them things that they don't know. And just that partnership and working together, that's what scientists do, to share your work. And it's the most exciting thing to learn about new projects. ASM has actually done a whole lot of work and given me the kind of exposure I've not, I wouldn't have had if I'm not a member of ASM. Many brains are better than one. So, great thing. It's a really member-driven organization. I love that. I've always loved that. Could make the bigger, the better, the, the more the merrier. You want to do microbiology? Become a member.